Welcome to the Behavior Speak podcast. Now, here's your host, Ben Ryman. Welcome to another episode of the Behavior Speak podcast. I'm your host, Ben Ryman. Uh, today, I'm privileged to have in the uh, in the uh, virtual studio Dr. Maria Cholich from uh, University of Hawaii, um, and uh, Maria is going to be talking to us about uh, some cool stuff. Uh, I, one thing I always love about uh, doing this podcast is I always get to learn things that I don't know, um, and uh, Maria's work is 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 really cool. She's been working kind of in the area of, of stigma. And I think a lot of folks have heard the word and kind of have an idea what it means, but you know, I think it's a pretty vague definition for a lot of folks. And so we're going to learn a lot about that. Uh, and then after, after we kind of dive into that, we're going to talk a little bit about a, a, a paper uh, that, that Maria wrote with uh, some colleagues, which essentially is, is, uh, is kind of a, a, a almost, almost a, a literature review. Um, uh, there's been um, a lot of really uh, awesome research that has come out sort of in the last few years uh, for, uh, from behavior analysts uh, in the area of racism. Uh, you know, certainly the, the things like George Floyd and whatnot have really, you know, ignited um, a fire um, and, uh, and, and opened up the eyes of a lot of folks. Um, and so there's been some really great conversations. And there's been a lot of great papers that have kind of come out um, 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 on racism. And uh, we actually talked about some of them in previous episodes, which we might reference to later. But the really, I, I really like this article because it, it's taking a lot of that research and kind of combining it together, and really, and it's really, really, really uh, consumable. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So again, welcome to the show. Aloha from Hawaii. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ben, for having me here. I'm really excited, uh, you know, to spend this I don't know two hours uh, discussing a little about stigma and uh, just sharing, you know, what I learned so far. Uh, you know, thinking where the field will go further. So thank you and thank you for this wonderful introduction and aloha to everyone who is listening. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, and uh, and uh, Hawaii has a special uh, meaning in my heart. I've never actually been to Hawaii, but um, I've been playing ukulele for 20 years. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the ukulele. And so uh, I, I love the Hawaii connection. And one day I'm going to get down there and actually see some some real players um, and, and get to enjoy some of that music. That's wonderful. Yeah. Before we get started in, in kind of your current work, I always like to kind of hear kind of uh, people's people's story of kind of how they got into the field. So I'm, I'm curious about sort of how you got into uh, uh, the field of behavior analysis. How, how did it all start for you? Okay. So let's go back then from where I'm originally from. <laughs> So sure. I'm from Serbia. It's one small country in southeastern Europe. And um, back then, when I was younger, <laughs> I did my uh, bachelor and master in psychology. And I also I did like mm. a bachelor in special education. But back then, there was um, kind of different type of studying when I started with a special ed. So it lasted actually almost five years. So um, hmm. although there was not like a formally master back then, it's it kind of gave a lot of um, knowledge and I would say introduced me to a lot of different like a theories um, that, you know, I was just like interested in learning further. So then obviously I was in Serbia, you know, finishing my school, finishing my PhD. And then suddenly I um, actually one of my friends, she moved to New York. And she found an internship in upstate New York in a place uh, called High Park. And uh, um, that internship um, where they offer was Anderson Center for Autism. So she found there and she was like, oh, my God, this looks so amazing. You should definitely apply because it was international internship. And I never really ever thought about learning, I mean, leaving home. But it sounded interesting to me and I kind of applied. I went through different interviews and it was accepted. So I came 2014 to U.S. And what was interesting about that was that um, they actually work with uh, children and adults with severe challenging behaviors, but they all had diagnosis mm. of autism and they actually used mm. ABA. So that's how I came. I mean, I never thought I, you know, because 
as you can see, my work is really related more like a social psychology. I try to yes. combine my experience from special ed and psychology and kind of, you know, really working on that. But then when I went to New York, as they said, they were providing ABA services that like a for children and adults, and obviously for children both on campus and in the school, and for the adult, they had a day have program, and they also had a houses. They were uh, they were in the community, so mm. I worked like there for eighteen months. And uh, when I came originally, I mean, I did hear about ABA back home, but there was no obviously BCBA. There was no any credential program or anyone who actually mm -hmm. practiced, you know, who could uh, share knowledge. So when I came here, you know, I had some understanding what ABA is, but actually when you start working and when you mm -hmm. see its effectiveness, you just, I mean, as everyone says, you know, you really fall in love with just how powerful it is and you mm -hmm. can really see all the changes. And that's how I started pretty much. I, um, I was really lucky enough that I got my internship in a um, kind of clinic I mean, kind of, they have like a clinical mm. team and because I was doing my PhD, so I was kind of able to get there and got my supervision and really have that kind of experience, like, um, just hands on. So that's how it started. And then I like, okay, what I need to, you know, do to get my BCBA. Um, and then I learned I need besides supervision to get, um, additional courses so then i apply for like um right. fit for verified course sequence because i already had this in my yes. master and everything and that's how i started brilliant and so so were you when you were in serbia were you working with autistic folk or did you just was it was the u.s your first introduction to no actually i was working in serbia as well at the be very beginning I was working actually as a special ed teacher in the high school. Um, and then uh, that was kind of very interesting. There was no, I mean, no any ABA, it's really educational setting. And I will say sure. for, um, we had like a, because it was high school and there, that was like a special high school, meaning only the kids who do have IEP, they were going there. But most of them needed kind of a little support. You know, I don't say that mm. really require like a lot of support. And then after that, I was working in a like a preschool. Again, as a kind of special ed teacher. And then a lot of them, yeah, the, the, the kids, they did have um, diagnosis of autism. Uh, kind of with like a mix in a group. Because in Serbia now, that is really off topic. It's not easy to get diagnosis of autism. It kind of takes... A lot of time for parents to get it, for they get, you know, some completely off like a learning disability. And then eventually mm. they might get. So it's not as easy. So that kind of thing and something that I did also, you know, wrote in my papers, it's not as easy to support families because you just even don't know mm. how many of the, you know, kids there are with, uh, you know, with autism. So, yeah. No, oh, absolutely. No, I, I, I don't think Serbia is going to be off topic at all today. I think because a, a lot of the work you've done already um, um, uh, in, in terms of stigma and whatnot was in Serbia. And so I definitely want to want to hear more about that piece. Um, so were you doing the, the stigma research before you came to the U.S.? Yes, actually, I did. Um, so how that actually started, because. Again, yeah. we have now gone back to Serbia just kind of to explain yes. because um, education is quite different than in the U.S. And usually when you start the first year, let's say psychology, it, it, that's mm. what you're going to be. You, you know, you don't need a Ph.D. to get uh, your licensure because in after master you, you are a psychologist because the, mm. the, from the day one, you only study psychology. And that means for mm. five years, you study psychology only. I mean, of course, there are some, you know, courses related like, you know, philosophy, maybe some uh, neuroscience thing, but pretty much you focus on that. It's very hard to switch. It's pretty much impossible. Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, in the U.S., you have opportunity after bachelor to go to master, let's say, you know, maybe you did bachelor in the special ed and then you do master in psychology. Yeah? In Serbia, it's very mm. hard. It's extremely hard to mm. do, meaning if you have a, bachelor in psychology that's it you go to master psychology it's kind of hard to switch so why this mm. is important mm. for your question and for a topic well 
because I had a both education kind of special ed and psychology, which is very uncommon to have. Right. And the interesting thing was most of the time psychologists are really focused on some other aspect, not as many on when they talk about research, they don't research as much, you know, um, let's say people with uh, disability and their families. On the other hand, mm. uh, people in the special ed, they don't work so much with those like a social psychology topic such as stigma. Mm. So I was mm-hmm. lucky to have mm-hmm. my mentor, uh, Dr. Ivona Milicic, who was actually doing that social aspect uh, of people with disability. And that's how I started with her. So we together started and we did kind of a lot of uh, research on stigma, discrimination. Back then, mostly um, we explore perception of the general public towards uh, people with disability, different types, maybe, you know, mm. um, and, mm-hmm. oh, and mm-hmm. mental illness was a big like uh, schizophrenia, eating disorder, uh, even with a drug mm. addiction. So that's how actually we started trying to combine these two fields uh, and do, you know, and do something new. Gotcha. Okay. So, so it, it, it was, it was kind of your mentor's uh, specialization that got you interested in. Sigma? Exactly. So that's how we started. Mm-hmm. So she was specialized and she mainly focused on stigma with, uh, towards people with mental illness. So that's what she was uh, really passionate about. And that's how we, yeah, that's how we started. Awesome. Well, maybe we can kind of break this down a bit because I think, you know, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, um, you know, st- st- I think stigma is a word that a lot of people know, but I don't know that people really understand it or understand what it means, you know, or, or understand, you know, that, it, you know, that, it, it, that, that there's different types and that it can be measured and sort of all, all the, there, 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 there's a lot, more, it's, it, it, there's a lot more to it. It's, it's, I think it's, it, I think we're, I think with, um, you know, and we'll talk about the, the, the black caregivers paper later, I think folks are really beginning to understand, you know, what racism means and what discrimination means and what prejudice means. But I think a lot of people, well, at least from my perspective, I mean, I don't really know what stigma means um, um, and, and what it's all about. And so maybe you could just kind of start by just telling us what stigma even is. Yeah. Um I mean, yeah, um, I will say I just want to also reflect what you said that, uh, you know, field is growing in that um, Mm. kind of direction, you know, trying to understand Mm -hmm. more the social, you know, aspects. So I think that is really amazing. I'm very happy about it. When we go back to the Mm -hmm. stigma, okay. So stigma as a concept was introduced a long time ago, like uh, 1963, by sociologists mm. whose name is Goffman. So pretty much if you guys and anyone ever read some paper on stigma, most likely you will find his reference. So he's kind of like a godfather of the term. Obviously, ah, okay. he didn't invent um, a word itself because it come or even the concept overall because come from the Greek, actually. You know, the Greek, mm. I mean, the Greece, the Greek were using to describe a mark that they were putting on people who, you know, did something bad. Let's say they may be, you know, um, maybe they were thief. Uh, they didn't uh, somehow fit in the, you know, social norm. So they were actually putting a real mark. And that kind of was wow. st- the word originally, um, you know, it comes from there. But then Goffman was actually the first one who introduced the word into uh, the social aspect, trying to understand mm. and explain that there are attributes, how he calls them, uh, we can say characteristics, that actually in a, in a given societies, in a given culture, lead to discrimination. Uh, leads to, I mean, ultimately will lead to discrimination. I will go back to explain some of the elements. So in that case, mm-hmm. if we think like the easier probably way to understand is that uh, because of what we possess as one of the characteristics, we, uh, we are probably va- less valued in the society. In that uh, there is a stigma mm. really in associated with that um, attribute that we have. And the most, mm. the most important is really about 
the culture and society because something that might be stigmatized in one culture in other can be really very different. You know, if we think about just, you know, children with disabilities in some cultures, like a Chinese culture, uh, and you can, I mean, there are like, um, you know, research on that. Uh, very often the parents will reflect and not just parents, the general public overall, and feel that having a child, you know, with disability is a punishment for mm. the sins they had in the past. But in mm. some other cultures, I think like a Filipino culture, they're very acceptable. And in some cultures, actually in the um, Indonesia, they believe it's like a blessing. Mm. So again, the same characteristic, the same child, you know, in two different cultures will uh, be treated differently. And that's pretty much what stigma is about having some attribute that uh, ultimately um, will discriminate you in a, in a society. And that's interesting. interesting. So it's kind of, kind of metaphorically, I suppose it really does kind of go back to that Latin definition. It really is like a mark on you uh, that that sort of shows you're, there's something wrong with you. You're not like everybody else. You're different. You're a problem. So that, that Latin kind of definition really does does apply exactly yeah that, that's true i mean in that case you know obviously uh you know we went through a more you know sociological aspect but that would be idea behind um something you have something you know you it you, you know your own characteristics is unfortunately you know perceived as negatively uh in the society yeah, and, and for sure, and and this this is obviously a, a a a a broad problem. I mean, we know we know in in the literature and sort of in just you know general conversation uh, or just any experience. I mean, I, I I spent my sort of early career working in working in group homes and and uh, you know and, and and that you had sort of alluded to around the day programs and the and the day habs and those sorts of things and and I remember sort of you know taking some of these folks you know out into the community you know maybe go for a walk or go to the store or do what you know just do things that people do in the community and you know they'd engage in you know maybe you know stimming or you know other kinds of behaviors or there might be challenging behavior because you know that's what was sort of the case with the group homes and we get lots of looks and we get lots of people sort of making comments and people telling us that those people shouldn't be outside and and why are you bringing them into the community and so you know the, this this stigma thing has been around forever and ever and ever and 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 you see parents hearing about it you hear stories about sort of parents going to the doctor to get their diagnosis and the doctor and and it starts with the doctor saying i've got bad news for you uh uh you're going to live a, a sad life now because your child is autistic and so sort of right from the beginning uh, the that that mark is really painted on them exactly and that is so so sad but i mean that is reality and you know I mean, U.S. Um, community, and I, you know, probably will say it's much more advanced in that sense that you know some other places where it's still very, it's still very shameful to have a child. But I want to just reflect quickly something you mentioned mm. because the example that you mm. talked about are pretty much examples of discrimination, and that is one I would say. Mm. You can think about like outcome of the stigma, because if we think like theoretically mm -hmm. about the stigma, we can say there are three components. One would mm -hmm. be first a stereotype. What we actually believe about a stigmatized you know, group or a stigmatized person, like you said, oh, OK, so there is already some belief in community. Let's say back then they should not be here. Why they're out you know, outside with us? They should, I don't know, mm -hmm. be inside. So that they're already, you know, we stereotype. We see someone who is steaming. Mm -hmm. We see someone who might, you know, have some challenging behaviors. We already have some beliefs about that. And then the mm -hmm. second step would be now a prejudice. So now you, see, mm -hmm. now you say, okay, I see this person, you know, you believe like, oh, the person who, as I said, like, you know, steam or has a challenging behavior should not be in community. And now you know, the prejudice is actually start agreeing with that. Because although there are stereotypes, it doesn't mean you have to agree. But, you know, over time and time mm -hmm. and, you know, through socialize, you know, socialization, you start agreeing with actually, 
you know, those stereotypes, negative attitudes. And then ultimately what happened will happen that, as you said, they will come and tell you, hey, why they're here, which is pretty much act mm-hmm. of discrimination directly, you mm-hmm. know, towards uh, you guys as the caretakers, you know, support workers and individuals itself. So it kind of seems like that sense is complex because all these components mm. are there, you know, involved in its, um, I would say, development. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that, and that, I mean, I think that's just, just even breaking it down and sort of add, I, I, I think many folks who would sort of say these things, you know, about, you know, um, you know, about the different people, different folks with disabilities and saying that, you know, they don't belong or they shouldn't be here or, or, or why don't you stop that? Or, you know, you're not a good parent. Why don't you deal with that? Um, you know, to, to sort of hear the words prejudice and discrimination, I think would be, would be pretty hard hitting for folks. I, I think a lot of folks probably wouldn't, wouldn't think they were being discriminate, discriminatory. They wouldn't equate it to, you know, the, the types of things we see in, 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 say, racism, for example, or sexism or, or those sorts of things. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, sometimes, um, you know, we said we're just, you know, we're not even uh, very often even aware we have any of those behaviors. And, you know, there was a, like a very interesting, um, and then when we wrote that, like a, a paper with the black caregivers, we really talk about mm. uh, racism and how actually you express it. So sometimes is that like, a, you know, covert mm. that you, you know, I mean, you might not be even aware you are doing it by making some statement. Mm. You just think it's okay to say something like, oh, you probably have, you know, um, like a public insurance, you know, seeing a black mm. caregiver, as they as they did mention in one of the papers, which is pretty much you maybe mm-hmm. as a physician, you don't think that is offensive or any act of racism, but mm. it is because we already mm-hmm. have certain prejudice and we do obviously, you know, express them in some way. But that's a good mm. point. And that's, I think, what is interesting about that, you know, there's so much talk, you know, about culture in some way and you know we need to be aware we need to be sensitive but then when you start working I feel very often and it is hard it's just hard for you know a person to reflect on its own beliefs and being able to recognize those small instances of the you know like a small instance of the like a racism in that case discrimination so Mm -hmm. it's kind Mm -hmm. of yeah it's very uh interesting just kind of like, a, you know, thinking about that. And obviously I feel as a field growing, uh, there will be more talk and, uh, you know, probably more trainings and everything that will improve, you know, our own perceptions. Because none of us is free For of sure. prejudice in that, you know, <laughs> if we, you know, if we Absolutely. think about that. So we just need to be able to actually uh, recognize them and really, you know, recognize those biases. Absolutely. So... One thing I noticed uh, in, 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 in some of the research that you've done is that, that uh, stigma in and of itself is, actually, is, 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 is almost like an umbrella term. It, it sounds like there, there, there are a lot of different sort of types of stigma and that we, we kind of need to sort of – why is it important to sort of separate that out? Like what are, what are these different types of stigma and how do they affect each other? Yeah, I mean, um, I love the question. <laughs> I mm. love the reason why. Uh, because even, I, uh, even, you know, nowadays, there are a lot of actually researchers who do mix them. And which is, you know, I try kind of really to explain my paper some basic, and mm. I will say why they're important, some basic uh, types of stigma. But, mm-hmm. you know, we need to understand. So um, first, the biggest field of the you know, stigma is a mental illness. And they really have a lot mm. of type of stigma. I'm not going to talk now about that because it will be kind of a lot. And why probably they do have, because the field is so big. There are so mm. many research done, like a, a waste mm. amount of the research. And what's happening, obviously, you do more, you learn more, and you, you know, make mm. a better categorization because you, you know, see there are different aspects of actually, you know, that concept. So what I was really mm. focusing mostly 
was on the stigma with the families because that, you know, I was really that I did my research, my dissertation actually on. And then because I was always, you know, working as a clinician, uh, providing later mm. home-based services, I really met so many families and I kind of was then inspired to understand more about, you know, what they're facing, how their life look mm. like, and what are some challenges. So when we talk about like a family stigma, I maybe will reflect only on three types. Let's think about okay. that. Just kind of, I think for the you know listeners, that probably would be enough now. Of course, there are more. <laughs> so when we talk three, we can think about experience stigma, perceived mm-hmm. stigma, and affiliate stigma. So I said there are more, but we kind of make, can focus on these three. And I will say sure. why they're kind of important. Uh, and that is something actually I'm kind of working now on kind of like a new paper, really understanding, you know, why stigma is important in ABA uh, f- field. So when we talk about mm. experience stigma, that is pretty much what you mentioned at the very beginning when you were in community you had a mm. you know you, you guys were given different looks you were receiving different mm-hmm. negative comments um mm-hmm. so pretty much experience stigma is really um an act of i would say discrimination an act you know that you or any person had in the past so you actually were exposed to the uh, some discrimination so in mm. that sense um you know, if we talk, let's say, about families. So they maybe mm-hmm. were not able to go with a children, you know, with a child um, to maybe the, you know, to some, to watch a movie, for example. Why? Because, um, you know, in the past, maybe they went once, yeah? And then someone was yelling, mm-hmm. why did you bring that child? Mm-hmm. So that would be an example of experience stigma. So some negative comments mm-hmm. towards, you know, them and their child. Um Mm-hmm. In that case, experience stigma could be, um, again, somebody could uh, let them you know, like uh, some of the black caregivers were saying, um, they were not allowed to go to different classes with their kids because they were black. So they said, no, mm-hmm. you cannot come. So that is also an example of experience stigma, meaning, you know, they were obviously discriminated because of the, you know, of their race to join some activities. Example would right. be if someone from, you know, outside, let's say maybe in the street comes to the, you know, walks and then see the parents with, I don't know, child, maybe in a wheelchair and come and, uh, you know, and give them again some negative comments. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. again would be kind of experience stigma. So pretty much everything that sure. a person experienced from the others in a, and most likely in a form of discrimination because of the, you know, attributes or, st- you know, that they possess. In that can, you know, mm. as I said, can be anything in this case if we talk about family um, and, you know, people with disability will be, uh, I mean, pretty much their, you know, diagnosis and then some of the behavior they might display. So that's mm-hmm. probably the easiest way what we actually experience, you know, and we know so we can kind of almost almost is the equal as discrimination. We can think about that. Hmm. Absolutely, no, that makes a lot of sense. And then we have perceived stigma. So perceived hmm. stigma is very interesting concept. Some people, in some, you might hear the word anticipated stigma. Um, some okay. people even might call it vicarious stigma. Di- different terms. Hmm. But I said, you know, yep. uh, kind of there are now even in the field of mental illness, they do uh, discriminate between anticipated and perceived and vicarious. So they kind of now made all the three different. Wow. Yeah, but we will focus now on <laughs> perceived stigma, nothing more yes. in the for this one. So when we talk about that and we can just think about words itself, it's we perceive something. So Mm. it's really about our perceptions of other people's attitudes. When I say perception, Mm -hmm. meaning, you know, I do believe that I might be discriminated if I go there. Uh, I do, you know, believe that uh, I will, uh, you know, maybe have some negative treatment because, you know, I I have a child with disability. So perceived stigma, it's really about 
kind of, you know, beliefs of about the negative attitude that public might hold against the family. Mm. I mean, against the person in general. So hmm. I don't, I want to just reflect here to say that doesn't, yeah. you know, because sometimes if it sounds like that, it seems like in their own head, but actually it's not like that because the perceived thing itself, it just doesn't come out of blue. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I just think they will not mm. like me. No, it's not like that. So it's most likely, and that like a research actually I did, it really showed that, you know, families who experience stigma a lot, they mm. actually had a higher score of perceived stigma, meaning that what you had in the mm. past led to, you know, you perceiving stigma from somewhere else. And I will, again, if I just go back to my example, uh, mm -hmm. If I were, if I had a negative attitude, yeah, so I have a child with disability with, let's say with autism, we went to the movie theater, my child maybe was loud at some scene, somebody was yelling, calling us name. Yeah. So that is experience mm -hmm. stigma. So mm -hmm. most likely what will happen in the future? I'm not going there. Most likely. Why? Because right. I will already perceive, I will expect that again, something similar will happen. And then why I would mm -hmm. expose myself and my child to that. I don't want it. So that is kind of really mm -hmm. important then to understand that although, uh, you know, they might not, maybe next time they go, we'll be fine. Yeah. And go next time. Nobody mm -hmm. say anything. But because of the, you know, fear and everything was happening in the past, I might actually uh, just stop myself from going anywhere. And that very often happens. You know, when we have, I will talk about affiliate stigma, but pretty much has very negative effect on family overall. Um, so, so, so essentially really you're talking about punishment, right? You know, so, uh, you know, I, I, I go into the movie theater, um, my child makes a noise, people call me names and tell me to go away. That's the punisher. And then I don't go back to the movies. Yeah. You can think about that. That's an interesting way to think. Yeah. It, it, you could, yeah, you could think about, hmm. but yeah, that would be one of the way that perceived stigma developed the other way is actually right. through socialization because we grow mm. yeah we are growing in the certain society and in mm. that society we learn what is good what is bad for those standards for mm. cultural values and very often you know when we actually growing we learn like oh for example you know in serbia it's very common that parents are kind of feel sorry for, you know, people pitying them. Oh, poor this mom, poor this dad, they have mm. this child. So it kind mm. of, you already have that, you know, in the, in the, um, while you're growing as a kid, you hear that, you hear that around you uh, right. constantly, you know, you hear from, you know, maybe your parents, from your friends, from the teacher, you hear it. And then, as we mm. said, you know, stereotypes are the first uh, part. And then most, most likely and most, co you know, commonly, the stereotypes, you know, will turn into prejudice and later lead to mm -hmm. discrimination. So again, right. we could, maybe some parents never had experienced a, a stigma, but they could still develop perceived because of mm. the way they, they grew up and what they learned I got it. during that time. Right, right, right. Yeah. And that's actually, a, that is very important for our feel and the treatment because I'm always thinking, you know, I came obviously here, you know, as an immigrant, different culture was very <laughs> different than my own. I had to adapt mm. a lot. And I'm thinking, True. if you are coming from some culture where having a child with disability, you know, with autism is highly stigmatizing. So you know that. Right. And maybe you come to US yeah. where it's very different. But mm -hmm. you still don't feel comfortable going with a child mm -hmm. to community. You don't want to mm -hmm. go to McDonald's to play, you know, play place. Mm -hmm. You don't want to maybe go to the park. But then me now as a mm -hmm. clinician, yeah, I'm like a BCBA and I am BCBA in the U.S. And I say, hey, but we need to teach him social skills. And I think we should go mm -hmm. to, I don't know, make a, you know, play date in the park, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the family who might come, as I said, you know, immigrant family, they might fear how they will be perceived how the child will be perceived in those circumstances. Mm. And, and mm. that is where I think we as clinicians will need to really take into consideration what they think, because we cannot just mm. push and be like, Oh no, no, we go. Some families might not even tell us 
they don't feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, that kind of thing, going back to the culture and understanding, uh, you know, in that culture, how, um, you know, how it's perceived, let's say, you know, having a child with disability and then based on that, actually setting up a treatment plan and, you know, the goals that would actually align with what parents feel comfortable with. And then over time, uh, you know, things will be different. But I think at Mm -hmm. the very beginning, we have to be really sensitive where family is coming from. And, you know, if they they are actually okay with having, you know, our, as I said, goals, you know, to be carry on outside. So... If you're planning on collecting continuing education credits for this episode, you'll need to go to www.cbiconsultants.com forward slash shop and enter the three secret words. The first secret word is stigma. Gotcha. Okay, so you've got the three types. So you've got the experience. That's kind of more of a direct sort of piece. Like I, I, I personally had someone tell me, you know, um, there's something wrong with my child or there's something wrong with um, the individual I'm supporting. And then you have the perceived stigma, which is, okay, I've had a lot of people, it could be from the, uh, the it could be from the um, 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 experience stigma. So I, I've had a bunch of experiences and now because I've had that sort of you know, history, um, I now think any other interaction with people at the playground will also be that way. Uh, but then are you saying that that socialization, is that the affiliate stigma? Is that what you mean? So socialization is actually one aspect or one way that we can acquire perceived stigma, meaning we, the perceived oh, okay. stigma can develop because of what we learned while we were growing up and socializing with the people. Just Mm -hmm. one of the way, you know, because I said in some cases, the families and the people overall, they can have perceived stigma, although they never actually experience it. So they never Mm -hmm. were exposed to Mm -hmm. any negative treatment, but maybe what they learned while they were growing up, or maybe they heard, hey, you know, having a child with autism, it's, it's a bad thing here. They perceive already negative treatment from others just based on the knowledge. And maybe, as I said, they Mm. never had experienced it. So that can happen as well. Mm. Okay. And and is that, but but you talked about three types. Exactly. So is that the third type? No, (laughs) no. Okay, so we're going to get into that Exactly. So the third type is affiliate stigma. And some people might call it self-stigma. Some people call internalized stigma. But idea would be Hmm. that a person who is in close contact with a stigmatized individual also bears stigma. So meaning that person Mm -hmm. itself doesn't have any attribute that is perceived negatively in community. But because Mm -hmm. of the relationship Mm -hmm. they might have with, uh, you know, that primarily stigmatized uh, individual, they do develop stigma. And I will explain actually what it is. So in that case, as I said, if we talk about uh, caregivers, Yeah. So they don't have autism. They don't have any, you know, disability, but because of their obviously a relationship with a child, they are stigmatized just by virtue of that relationship. Mm -hmm. And that is, that actually, um, I mean, I will say like a a kind of like a, it's more complicated than that, but I just want to first explain the term. Mm-hmm. who actually bears this affiliate stigma. So that's why it's called mm-hmm. affiliate because they're affiliated to the, you know, primarily stigmatized. But what is characteristic mm-hmm. with affiliate stigma when we compare her, I mean, this type with uh, experience and perceived is that we actually, whoever, you know, bears this type of stigma kind of internalize or apply to self. So what does that mean now? <laughs> <laughs> kind of bear with me, guys. We are coming to the probably, you know, like uh, to the end. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. Would mean that again, I'm a parent and I do, mm. you know, know there are d- different uh, negative, you know, stereotypes. Yeah. And uh, about uh, not just children with disability, but mm-hmm. parent itself. Maybe it's parent, you know, it's their fault. 
um, they, you know, they should take care better for their child. They should live better. Maybe they did some sins in the past. So in any case, there are some beliefs that it's somehow, you know, a, you know, fault of the parent for having a child, let's say, with mm. disability. So what that then actually does to the uh, parent? Well, it leads to that that parents start believing it in that itself. Oh, I might be a bad parent. And that's why, you know, my child does not behave well. That's why my child, um, you know, is, uh, you know, have challenging behaviors. So parents kind of start mm. already, be, you know, start kind of believing um, in those negative attitudes that exist in society. Mm. And then what then happened when they start applying to itself, that pretty much leads to kind of social exclusion in, in that sense. So they start mm -hmm. believing, oh, I am a bad parent. I value, I know, I value less, you know, I'm less worthy than others. Uh, my, mm. you know, uh, reputation is damaged. I don't have any more the same value in society. So mm. when they kind of start believing, you know, in those uh, negative attitudes, uh, it pretty much really leads to, as I said, that like a social exclusion. So they kind of stop themselves from, you know, just going community having relationship with other people mm. and it's it's wow. really kind of you know related to the, the you know depression um and you know different uh you know negative mental health uh, aspects uh so that's kind of really wow. important to understand that not everyone mm -hmm. de develops obviously affiliate uh, stigma um or later you know, as i said some people call self-stigma but the people who do mm. it, it it has really like I can have really negative effects. So, so that's something as well, you know, important for us as clinicians to understand, you know, if we do have some families or some parents who really feel, you know, they're not worthy and then, uh, you know, we need to support them. We just need, you know, obviously through, uh, you know, our parent goals and parent training to really work on that and help them, you know, see that they are worthy much much more than you know they could ever believe so that's interesting is there anything because you say sort of some folks some folks experience the affiliated stigma and and some folks don't is there anything that kind of that can kind of predict that like are, are some folks more likely to experience you know, affiliated stigma. Than yeah, others. exactly. Um, so not as many research has been done on that actually, but the one that they hmm. did do, and I kind of did one of, first of all, the obviously parents who were exposed to stigma, like, you know, had experienced hmm. stigma and the one who perceived stigma more, they, they also most likely will uh, internalize, meaning they will, hmm. you know, as I said, start believing in those negative attitudes. There are some like a hmm. kind of personality factors uh, that, you know, parents who have high score in neuroticism, they're also most likely to um, to develop uh, like affiliate stigma or self-stigma. Mm. But there are like a very interesting mm. conceptual paper that Corrigan, uh, I think Watson, they wrote, um, really discussing because that was one of the questions, you know, they did research with uh, people with mental illness and actually the self-stigma term comes from them. But they were exactly asking mm. that why some people start fighting and empower themselves while some people um, develop self-stigma. Because it's kind of like a really mm. interesting. There will be some people who just start fighting, you know. And that is the same with the families, you know, because I, luckily I was able to stay in contact with a lot of Serbian families who were part of my study. So, uh, yeah, I kind of was doing, uh, I'm still doing actually like a free uh, webinars on ABA. It will be now two years I do every month. And they come, the families come, the parents, and a lot of actually uh, coll colleagues. Hmm. So I kind of, you know, kept in touch with a lot of them. And it's kind of interesting, you know, the parents who do come, they're really one who actually are empowered. You know, and they do fight. They want to learn. They want to, you know, get the best for the child in the terms um of maybe like a going against authority. The parents who develop self-esteem, obviously they want also the best for the child, uh, but it might be just mm -hmm. too hard for them to, you know, go against authority and maybe just like a fight because, you know, 
it's just hard living in different cultures. You're under so much stress. Mm. And if you don't have any support, you feel like you're just, you know, by yourself. And it, and that is really, mm-hmm. I mean, it will be hard for anyone, you know, because I know when I, you know, was reading some research uh, from Taiwan, let's say they had, um, they did it with the parents, with the children, with the cerebral palsy. You know, one of the mother, mm. you know, was saying exactly that, just no support. You are blamed for everything. Uh, you are blamed mm. that you didn't have a good diet. You pretty much left alone in that sense. So that, I mean, I mm-hmm. cannot even imagine how hard that, you know, can easy is for the family. So I think that's mm-hmm. probably, you know, a lot of like um, social support if it's available. Um, I think mm-hmm. it's really crucial as well. Mm-hmm. You, you, you touched on, and I don't want to go maybe too deep into this because it might be a whole different area, but you touched on that there's a kind of a relationship between neuroticism and stigma. Uh, what, what do you mean by neurotic? What is neuroticism? That is a wonderful question. Well, if we think about just, I mean, obviously how we first measure, we measure, as we know, just through the test, yeah? And those tests are pretty much... Mm subjective in the terms you ask somebody certain questions and they respond so what they were doing i mean um obviously there are a bunch bunch a bunch of research uh in that area it's really about how you react to different um perceptions yeah i mean different situations sorry mm. so one of mm. the things would mm. be if you um let's say um, some people in a stressful situation they might be uh you know, in that term, like a stronger, they maybe see more positive be like, okay, it is hard now, but tomorrow will be better. Mm. While some people will be maybe more pessimistic and say like, okay, this is really bad. You know, I cannot deal with this. You know, I just cannot, mm-hmm. you know, have any, I don't have any strength to go through it. So pretty much all those mm. tests, I mean, that they measure, you know, personality, it's about how you react in different situations. I think that's probably the easiest way mm-hmm. to say. So how you mm-hmm, react, mm-hmm. you know, in the, um, if we talk about neuroticism, how you react in the stressful situation, how you perceive, mm. um, you know, each of the, you know, each of the, uh, you know, aspects. Um, so in that case, I mean, because I did have like, you know, discussion with some you know, uh, people, you know, yeah. ABA, like it, it, there is something as, personality at all because as we know it's really mm-hmm. about test you just have a question <laughs> and the, the test and yeah. question are designed in hope to measure that underlying factors like a fat sets you know if we think about mm-hmm. big five yeah if you think about big mm-hmm. five but i mean we can all, always you know argue <laughs> is there such a thing but if we think about just the way we react yeah the way mm-hmm. we react so maybe that's something we could think about as uh, mm. some type of personality you know are we if we think about openness are we you know explorer do we want to go out and explore or we just you know enjoy more reading the books so in this mm-hmm. case it's really about neuroticism like uh, the way you react in the stressful situation right yeah, it almost sounds like like it's kind of related to resilience in a way, and and so exactly. you know, uh, I think I think the more resilient you are, maybe the less neurotic you might exactly. Be. Yeah, that's interesting. Exactly. So, so you, yeah, go no, ahead. No, that, that's good that you mentioned because there are some even resilient. Some people there are actually you know researchers who also uh, treat that as a our trait because like in your it right. would be like a, just a trait, yeah, something we do have. Mm-hmm. Um, and some mm-hmm. of them, even that, like resilience, will uh, identify, not completely identify with neuroticism, but they will look at a trait that is pretty much stable over time. So that's something as mm-hmm. well, like a characteristic. It's a overall stable. It kind of can change, mm-hmm. but it's not going to be from someone who is always happy to, you know, depressed overnight. So it just doesn't happen like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you talked to actually it kind of leads into my next question, which you, you talked about sort of those personality traits and, and those measurements that, you know, sort of psychologists use to measure all those sorts of things. Um, um, you know, behavior analysts, you know, we like measuring stuff. Um, uh, is stigma something we can measure? I mean, yeah, there are actually uh, scales, you know, different scales we can measure. Um 
So we could definitely that how research it came up with. And again, I mean, all the scales, which is really important to understand, they give us some, I would say like a general overview. Because, you know, let's say mm. if I, so for, for example, for the study I did for the perceived stigma, I created a scale. Yeah. I developed the scale mm. and then, you know, had to go through a bunch of statistic analysis, like a lot, a lot, mm-hmm. a lot of eventually from 20 items that I started, I came, I think, to eight or nine. That's how, because right. eight or nine was kind of reflective. But again, think about those are just eight or nine and they cover very specific area. So perceived stigma can mm-hmm. be so much broader, you know, because you maybe perceive stigma mm-hmm. from the teachers. Maybe you perceive stigma from, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the community workers, maybe from healthcare workers, mm-hmm. maybe from general public. So mm-hmm. there is no one scale that can cover everything. Just no. Mm-hmm. But there are mm-hmm. scales that could, you know, cover some segments. Like, you know, as I said, what I did, I did with, a, you know, a perceived stigma of the negative uh, attitude of the general population. In general, how people were perceived. Mm-hmm. But doesn't mean that that covers everything. But it does. So, mm-hmm. you know, as I said, probably will, you know, will become more. I'm sure will be more scales in the social psychology. Sure, sure, I mean, sure. I think they're probably, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I'm sure probably over like a 50 just to measure personality. <laughs> there are a lot, like yeah, a exactly. lot. So you talked about, you've talked a lot about sort of um, uh, kind of how because you started doing some of this research in Serbia, is 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 stigma sort of as, maybe as it applies to maybe, is stigma different in Serbia than it might be here? I think so, yeah. I, I uh, definitely, I mean, no, I think I, it is. The reason, yeah, it is. <laughs> the reason, again, when you look at a Serbia, I would say that stigma is the, the least present in, in the bigger cities. And the bigger cities, mm-hmm. like everywhere, you know, it's just different just different like lifestyle people you know busy uh people learn more educate more um and kind of obviously are more open to diversity uh in the smaller places mm-hmm. especially in the villages it's still very hard to you know have a child so i know you know some families um they're very embarrassed so they never ever go with their child anywhere you know like they brought a child to the mm-hmm. school and then mm-hmm. that's it child maybe come back mm-hmm. home and that's it they don't go so maybe mm-hmm. they have some uh you know like because they they might have some animals you know uh, livestock the, the the around the house so maybe child plays there but most of the time mm-hmm. they don't go like you know oh let's go to the park or let's go to the mall mm-hmm. let's go to the store it's it's not as common and that's probably because mm-hmm. as we said of perceived stigma you know they kind of perceive mm-hmm. what public might think and just parents avoid doing it. So I know from my personal experience, I know the people, some of my cousins who just are embarrassed having a child with a disability and they don't go anywhere, like anywhere with that mm-hmm. person, with the, with their mm-hmm. child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. While here, yeah, I'm, I think probably depends. Yeah, yeah. I feel probably depends, you know, of the, of the place, but what I could see at least from these seven years how long i have been here i feel a society is more open to accept you know and less to maybe you know show like any sign of discrimination at least that like a mm. uh, open one that makes sense so it's it's pretty clear from all the, all the all of the examples and explanations you get kind of what the effect is on sort of caregivers and families. I mean, they, they essentially, <clears throat> there's a lot of avoidance um, and, 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 you know, they, they, they don't take the, they don't take their kids or their, or their, you know, um, or the folks are supporting out in community. They avoid others. They, they don't socialize. Um, they, they kind of stay solitary. Um I'm curious, and 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 I don't, and maybe this work hasn't been done yet, so you might just be hypothesizing. But I'm I'm wondering, kind of, 
you know, because I think this is really important for BCBAs to be thinking about. I mean, all of it is uh, certainly all of it is in certain in terms of sort of trying to, you know, uh, get a parent to sort of, you know, follow a plan and, and, um, and you know, and be open to some of these goals. I mean, I, that that's pretty clear. I, I, I'm curious if we have any sort of idea on kind of what you know, maybe the more longer term effects of, 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 of this stigma, these types of stigma is on the actual individuals with disabilities. Yeah. I mean, I think, well, I mean, we can respond to that question going back what you just said, you know, if parents mm. are actually, and there are research even done in the U S I mean, they did like, um, I think 2003 back then the green author, mm. Sarah green, mm. who is also mother of the girl, with a cerebral palsy. So mm. she actually did the research mm-hmm. and she also noticed that a lot of uh, mothers were uh, with a higher, let's say, level of perceived stigma. They were actually excluding themselves from going in community. And then later, some of the mm. researchers actually also found that that affect, that, so that those kids were actually have less interaction with the peers and less meaningful interaction because, I mean, which is logical, <laughs> logical. They don't go out, so mm-hmm. how are they going even to learn to play? So they have very limited mm-hmm. um, opportunities. So in that case, I think a long mm-hmm. term, it's like really that, because if they don't go to community, if they don't have access to different, uh, you know, activities, uh, to different programs, trainings, to the peers, mm-hmm. over time, mm-hmm. you know, uh, having, uh, I mean, being deprived of all of that, definitely will have negative impact because we have some and you know we have that person and we have the you know person who had access to all of these things so uh, if we compare these two at the age of 15 or 20 i'm sure it will be like a big difference in their skills uh, Mm -hmm. level uh Mm -hmm. just you know based you know what they had in the past i think it's really in that case like um really serious you know, think, mm-hmm. um, and that's that's why kind of now some research, but very little, honestly, uh, are thinking about how we can actually, uh, you know, help family to decrease stigma. And I think, you know, I'm not as familiar with the mm-hmm. act. I never actually, you know, I mean, I did read a paper and everything, but I never actually did mm-hmm, for myself. Mm-hmm. But that's maybe something, you know, that in our field, you know, could be used. Uh, as a way mm-hmm. to actually help a family. So maybe someone of you guys, if you do act, you could maybe even, you know, think about modifying, um, you know, approach and really see uh, how to, I believe actually that um, Denisha, uh, I might not pronounce well last name, Jingles. Jingles. Yeah, Jingles. Jingles. I think that yep. she kind of suggested some of the adaptation of the act for kind of uh, in her paper that she wrote for the, uh, like uh, now for the BAP, she kind of suggested some ideas how yep. to adapt, act to uh, help fight in th- uh, like a internalized racism, which is kind of similar. It's not completely mm-hmm. like stigma, but it, there is similar concept mm-hmm. in that sense. So that's maybe one way to go Absolutely. and think. And I think it, it would be actually really good, you know, having something like that. No, I, th- I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and and that the, that was going to be a later question. If if uh, I was wondering if maybe folks were doing act with stigma, so it sounds like maybe they aren't yet, or at least not in research. So that'd be yeah, definitely. I think there'll be folks out there. That yeah, would be there are actually some of yeah, but that. there are sorry, there are some of the researchers, but uh, like uh, from you know relation frame theory, they were using an act mm. to decrease stigma for mm. uh, uh, in general a uh, population, but nobody did with a family. Oh, okay. So that's something. Uh, it, uh, that's something, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, open out there for you guys. <laughs> very cool, very cool. You know, it, 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 um, it, the, the part of the reason I asked that question is there's, there's, there's often been an assumption that, uh, you know, folks, particularly folks with, you know, intellectual disabilities, um, sometimes autistic folks as well, that, that they all engage in challenging behavior all the time. And that that's just part of the part of the diagnosis, which we know isn't true, but that's just that that's been a belief. And, and so often, I think often it's been thought that the reason, you know, families or group home staff or whoever don't 
let these folks go in community is because um, the, that because they'll engage in some sort of you know challenging behavior and hurt somebody in the community or you know or something worse. Um, but I think more so, you know, I mean, maybe that's happened once before. It's possible for some of those occasions, and I think we often hear, we often see the the you know from the the behavior support plan you know that was written. 15 years ago that said, you know, the individual engages in challenging behavior and maybe they haven't for 15 years, but that's still sort of something that's, you know, uh, a part, uh, you know, a part of their, uh, you know, uh, it's a stigma. Um, and so, you know, it, it makes me think that, you know, stigma may, may be more of the reason why folks don't go out in community and don't aren't able to access, you know, um, social supports and those sorts of things versus challenging behavior. Like it's, um, it, it's a belief that there's challenging behavior, even when it doesn't exist. Exactly. I love the, uh, the, you know, the point you made and that is really true. And that's, you know, very often, you know, what people think, Oh, you have a child with autism, that child cannot do anything. I mean, it's not true. I mean, we all, you know, yeah. we all know, I mean, yeah, it's a spectrum, but even with that, you said, okay, you know, the, you know, a person has intellectual disability, oh, it's going to hurt somebody. Unfortunately, there are those beliefs. But that is why education is so important. Um, educa mm -hmm. So education and contact, those two factors have been shown so far to be really effective in reducing the negative attitudes. Because if you mm -hmm. learn about it and mm -hmm. be able to actually have a contact, when I say contact, it's not like, oh, you know, that person is next to, you know, in the classroom next to me. No, we actually do things together. Mm -hmm. We might have a class together. Mm -hmm. We maybe do some activities together. We go, let's say, you know, if we are working, we work together. That type of contact right. uh, that you actually have opportunity to learn about the person. And that really helped, uh, you know, when they actually, you know, did research, really helped in decreasing the negative attitudes and discrimination overall. Like, a, so it's really important having that. The second secret word is Serbia. So besides, we already talked about ACT as being an option. What else can behavior analysts, and you're kind of alluding it to it right there just, just a minute ago, but. What, what, what are the things that maybe we as behavior analysts, and I guess really just anyone listening, um, you know, can do about stigma? Stigma, in, you mean uh, that, you know, family might be facing or stigma that yeah. general education yeah. has? So, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe, <laughs> both. maybe both. I mean, I mean, like, how, exactly. can, we, how can we combat that stigma? I, I think oh, it's no. probably similar a similar question to how we're going to combat racism as we talk about the next Exactly. Year. Well, I think first, if we think about, you know, the general public, yeah, I think really having that yeah. educational piece, um, mm -hmm. if possible, you know, having some uh, contact, because if you do have a contact, yeah, and you do enjoy, uh, you know, in activities with that person, let's say with a, you know, autistic adult, in that case, mm. you know, as we know, there will be a lot of reinforcer involved. You know, you're doing something, you're having a fun time, you're enjoying. So that means, you know, mm -hmm. that good experience is also relating now to the person you're working with. So if you have a more and more of mm -hmm. those experiences, most likely, you know, you will be enjoying that. Oh, why not? I want to have this, you know, person, you know, working with mm -hmm. me because it's always so fun. That's this person is very creative. In that case, you know, or maybe this person brings something new or like the way, you know, person approaches certain activities. If that's the case, uh, you know, and just kind of having some more pleasant uh, interactions at the beginning, you know, at least when you, you know, if nobody ever had experience, it's a good way to start. And really explaining, you know, um, working on that like a just knowledge component and really kind of explaining, you know, what it is characteristic and how can we, you know, support you know, overall. And I think that is might be one of the issues in some of the schools that kids are kind of in inclusion, but they're not actually included. How to say, you know, yeah, they're in the classroom, yes. but they have their own thing that they do. So they don't, they yes. don't do with a general yes. ad. And, you know, they have some like a doll who is always with them. Well, I mean, yeah, how that's problem. Mm -hmm. Because how are we going to mm -hmm. then really... All the other kids, you know, if then general ed, you know, being able to learn about, you know, 
this, you know, the child if we don't make anything jointly. So that could be something, you know, just really starting even from, you know, that step in the school. When we do, you know, make a group, if they eat, you know, if the kids are eating, they should eat all together. Instead of like, oh, no, this person, you know, like mm-hmm. with autism should mm-hmm. eat at the end, you know, sit at the end of the table. Yep. Because that is already, you know, stigma. I mean, that we already segregating um, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. person. So there are mm-hmm. a lot of those examples if we just think about starting, you know, so... Uh, Mm-hmm. I think that would be a good way to start, you know, really from their opening eyes about, um, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking there are a lot of com- campaigns, you know, doing that, trying really to understand we're all different and different in mm-hmm. different ways. Mm-hmm. And we are, you know, here to accept yep. that diversity because that is beauty of the world. Imagine if we're all the same, how boring it will be. <laughs> so that's why, mm-hmm. you know, having, I think, a positive also aspect um, of the, you know, of the, you know, having, you know, disability, it's also something we should reflect because a lot of family, families, they do report on um, being, mm-hmm. they change it in a positive way, you know, because they might become more right. patient, more tolerant, more compassionate, uh, having, you know, uh, more grateful. So those are really good things uh, mm. that I think each of us working in a field can, you know, feel that. And, you know, so I think that's Mm -hmm. one way. And now when we actually talk about families, if we work with Mm -hmm. a family and with a child, I really, you know, I really feel having that kind of a teamwork, meaning, you know, when we, at least, you know, what I was really, you know, trying also to say to my students and when I was, you know, working with the families, Never like a pushing, oh, we're going to do this. Well, no, we said, okay, give an option. Like, for example, if I want to work on, on the social skills, yeah, and I said, well, what do you think about that? I would, you know, I think would be good for, uh, I don't know, you know, your child that we work on that because it will help him in the school setting, so and so. What do you, you know, what do you think mm. about maybe having some play dates? Do you have someone who could come mm. here? Or maybe what do you think about mm. going to community? Maybe giving an option, I think it's a good first step instead of just saying, do this. Because, Mm -hmm. you know, parents might be like, maybe they really do when we are there, but that pretty much will stop. You know, they're not going to carry on in in that Mm -hmm. case. So I think Mm -hmm. we need to, you know, understand what family feels comfortable with and from there, you know, to start with intervention. So I would always suggest give an option, give a choices. And we can always, um, mm-hmm. you know, through the choices, you know, understand that. Give for, look for those subtle mm-hmm. cues. Because if I know when I was working with one family, you know, I suggested exactly that, hey, why we don't go to community? You know, like uh, just kind of working on a walking, uh, just, uh, just kind of having different skills. So I was kind of suggesting mm-hmm. that, uh, but then I did notice that, you know, every time, you know, if it comes, like, hey, what do you think? You know, it's today the day the parents will have like, oh, we cannot do it today, you know. So kind of like a, after a couple of times, I realized that they actually didn't want it, but they didn't feel comfortable saying because, as we know, parents are afraid of losing services. So they maybe think right. like, oh, if I say no, they will take it away. And I already been waiting for one year for you guys. And now, I, I, hmm. so that is something, you know, just they're free. So they were like, oh, you know, in that case, it, in, you know, you can always say, you know what? As I said, that if it's, you know, if it's not something as important this moment, we can always work later. Don't worry. There are a lot of other things we can work on. You know, if you feel um, mm-hmm. something, you know, later we want to reintroduce, we can always do. So kind of, I feel really helping family understand that we are there from them, you know, for them. And then mm-hmm. whatever we want to offer will be kind of like a step, you know, just taking that step by step. I think it, it is important building mm-hmm. that report and having a trust. And through that, obviously, you know, like when you, we start with those small steps later on, we can build, you know, and explaining, um, you know, really explaining because we cannot do anything with experience stigma i mean the experience that's it you know when Mm -hmm, they can mm -hmm. but we can you know help them to really empower themselves in that sense Mm -hmm. you know be like yeah it it might be 
like a challenging, but you know, we go to the places, uh, right. you know, where you feel comfortable beginning because if they do meet those positive contingencies outside and we all know, like you go, mm -hmm. you have a more and more like a positive experiences, most likely you will feel more comfortable going out instead of just being like embarrassed and be like, oh, I don't want to go. Mm -hmm. Like with everything, I think we start as adult. I know, um, you know, some, I start surfing here. For example, at so the beginning it was hard yeah. because, you know, you're adult, you know, you have no idea to surf. Everyone around you looks so mm -hmm. amazing. So, you know, the beginning, it's kind of like not as easy. You start to try to go places where, you know, you don't see as good surfers, where there are not a lot of people until you kind of build mm -hmm. the confidence and then start going to the mm -hmm. more crowded places. So I think the same. Mm -hmm. If we just go step by step and help family, you know, need and i will say those like a positive contingency i feel will help them a lot that's cool uh i have one more stigma question then we'll jump into this black caregivers paper it's and, and, and it's kind of related to, to sort of the the intervention piece i mean it sounds like you know you, you've talked about uh, the the sort of individual kind of parental kind of approach there to sort of work on some of that perceived stigma and then the uh, the uh, the uh, general approach to kind of maybe reduce some of the experience stigma by teaching these other folks, you know, about kind of how to how to how to, how to kind of treat those folks. Um, one thing you mentioned earlier, and 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 of course because of all the work you've done in Serbia, you're you're well aware of kind of you know how stigma manifests in Serbia and, and having that understanding, you know, you can come back if you have say immigrant families, you know, from Serbia or, or I don't know if it's similar in other Eastern European countries, but coming that, that have, that have moved, you know, immigrated to, to North America and you're aware of that, you, you having that specific knowledge and accessing some of these papers to know that, you know, you, you can, you can, you can come at it from a different lens. And I know it's really important and there's been a lot of talk in a lot of these uh, papers that have come out recently about sort of culturally responsive practice, uh, that it's really important to have, you know, a more of an understanding of, 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 uh, of some of those cultural components. Um, is there, has there been research done in, in a lot of different countries so that some like, so the BCBA like me might have say, uh, Maybe a Japanese family comes to town, and and I want to know if there's sort of a, you know a, a general level of uh, of kind of stigma in, in in Japanese culture towards autism. Just for an example, um, is, is is there research out there in 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 multiple countries about what how stigma kind of manifests? So okay, so the best in that case, to what you know we could do as an analyst would be actually to read. Uh, a qualitative studies about just mm. parental experiences overall because very often they are as well about mm. stigma. I mean, they will talk about mm. because, yeah, there are, I yes. mean, a lot of research on stigma actually has been done in Chinese culture, like a majority mm, yes. coming from China. Yep. But there are some of the studies, you know, you know, uh, from Africa, uh, some uh, from, you know, yes. South America. So there are. So those are good places to go. So that I would do. I would find, you know, some okay. of, the, of the article that actually explore specifically, you know, that culture and read what parents were saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. How, what they actually experienced, how they perceive, you know, especially there are some also research about diagnosis, how parents receive diagnosis and what they think about it. That's also also where you know very good uh, place to look for. Um, so I would that you know do there are no like um actually that you know somebody did um, multiple family you know multiple cultures in one paper when it comes to the families. Mm -hmm. I don't I never read that type. There are maybe two three yeah. papers that they explore like a general public stigma like in a China and U.S. Let's say so that that that, that we have. But when it comes to the families. I don't think there is any like that type of kind of international collaboration, but I think that would be a good way mm -hmm. to go to check some of the. No, yeah. that, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Going going kind of to the parental experiences kind of angle. Uh, I know there are quite a few 
kind of cross cultural in like cross cultural psychology. Uh, there's a lot of kind of papers that sort of talk about parental experiences of raising children uh, with a variety of disabilities. Uh, we had an episode on the, on the podcast uh, uh, with with Adair Carden talking about um, uh, parental experiences, comparing com- parental experiences of raising children with autism in Senegal versus Perfect. the U.S. Exactly. And she talked she, she she talked a lot about that. So I think yeah, I think that's that's the direction to go because I think folks will start looking up stigma might start looking up stigma yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. and look for something stigma specific. But but I think you're right. The parental experiences they may not call it stigma, but but exactly yeah. So that's great. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. So that's great one. Yeah, that's cool. Right on. Okay, so let's 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 uh, jump into this other paper here. Uh, I think I think I, I I didn't realize sort of in the beginning. I, I uh, when I when I first kind of wanted to bring you on the podcast, I just saw that you did the research in stigma, and then I saw this other article. I said, "Well, we got to talk about this too." But after our conversation today, I mean, and and, and the examples that you've already given, they're really interrelated um, um, in a lot of ways, and so it makes sense that you would you would be involved in this research. But I'll still ask the question anyway um, of. Uh, 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 the article is, by the way, called, and folks will see it in the show notes, uh, Black Caregivers' Perspective on Racism in ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder Services, uh, Toward a Culturally Responsive ABA Practice. Um, what what was the reason for writing this article? Yeah, well, as we, I think you already had like a, a Natalia, yes, like a virus. She was also talking a little about that emergency series yes. in ABAP, yeah? So uh, that's exactly yep. where it started. So I think at that moment, we really mm. all wanted somehow to contribute to the field and mm-hmm. actually to, you know, to our, uh, like, um, for our practitioners to not be just like a theoretical mm-hmm. paper about what we could do, but actually practical. Hey, these are the things, mm-hmm. you know, we should be doing. So, and uh, mm-hmm. again, and I've been interested in the, uh, you know, ex- family experiences, like a caregiver experiences mm-hmm. overall, you know, I was doing about stigma and just kind of, you know, reading. So I, I kind of then thought, oh, this would be actually a great uh, moment, like a really, you know, good time to put that together. Like uh, my, you know, passion mm-hmm. for, uh, f- you know, helping families and something that, you know, we can do in ABA. So pretty much that's how I started, mm-hmm. you know, and I was, you know, when I was thinking to conceptualize paper i was really thinking about that okay we want to provide some guide you know guidelines kind of how to work but based on what Mm -hmm. you know that was my thought Mm -hmm. like okay but so what because i just think that's good or maybe you know we as a group of my colleagues think and then i realized well why actually we don't go we find the papers qualitative papers that actually explored mm. experiences of, you know, black caregivers with uh, children with autism and use that as our baseline and our foundation to develop steps for us like, uh, you know, ABA practitioner. So that's how it started. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. And, and I love, I love, uh, I, I think there's been a real, um, uh, you know, kind of what's the word I'm looking for? There's been a lot more research now that's qualitative that's been coming out in ABA, which I think has just been awesome. I mean, I think for 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 the longest time we've been a really quantitative kind of field, really focused on specific numbers and 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 measurement and whatnot, and and those are good and those are important. Um, and you know, and particularly if you're doing sort of you know a, a kind of a group study or a, you know RCT kind of thing, you you definitely need to have you know some of those some uh, some of that consistency in there. Uh, but you know, I think you really miss out on 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 um, on on some on some really kind of powerful information uh, when, when you kind of if you don't get right in there and and start listening to people's stories. And I think stories have really become um, you know, uh, uh, an important piece that we're seeing a lot more in studies. Um, so I, I thought it was really cool that 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 uh, you kind of took this approach. And and one thing I love just about this article, um, that kind of is is, and, and I've seen this with a couple of articles. I saw this was with, uh, with uh, Natalia Byrus's article as well um, uh, on on kind of listening uh, on on sort of on listening skills in terms of racism. 
um, was kind of how how the article is broken down. Like it's a this article was really easy to read um, for two reasons. One, uh, just all the different headings and kind of yeah. You know, you know, sections, I think was really helpful. But what I really liked about this article was the quotations. Um, and you have lots of really good kind of quotes um, that come out of some of these other researchers that 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 uh, you quoted, some who are, I think, co-authors as well uh, on this study. Um, and, and they're just really powerful quotations. Um, uh, um, 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 uh, there's like uh, one, 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 for example, here, um, um, uh, um, uh, what was the, there was one there was one here that I really liked. It was, um, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, like I said, I've had a lot of bad experiences. I can't think of anything else to put it on than my color. You know, we're in a primarily white neighborhood. You hate to say it's because of your color. I try to look at everything else. And then when everything else doesn't line up, then you have to say, maybe it was my color. Maybe it was because I was black. Maybe it was because I didn't come in talking in a certain way. Maybe it was because they had a different expectation of me when they saw that I had expectations for my child. Maybe they didn't want to fulfill that. You don't want to think that way, but you have to look at that. It's too blatant for you not to. These are just really, really, really powerful you know, messages that you're not going to get from a, from a quantitative study. Uh, is, is that, is that part of the reason why you kind of went the qualitative way and why you chose to kind of include these specific? Yeah, quotes? exactly. Yeah. That was the reason because, um, you know, that's what I said, just getting a number, <laughs> we don't get anywhere. So, you know, I really mm-hmm. wanted to just go and read, you know, and I think we found everything that was back, you know, out there. Uh, in, in involved uh, black caregivers, and we really went through all those, you know, citation. Uh, we went through, mm-hmm. you know, all, you know, obviously each paper, trying to see what they were, you know, going through, and then kind of do some type of narrative review. And you know, we were lucky mm-hmm. because we wanted, you know, originally, you know, show I by and I, we kind of started with the paper, just kind of idea. But then, you know, we mm-hmm. wanted also to include, um, uh, like, a Temple Love, uh, Lovelace because she did a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And then we were lucky. And she's also, uh, as we know, uh, also BCBAD. Uh, so we kind of wanted really to have her on a board because we felt her experience will be so important to actually write mm-hmm. this paper right. And she mm-hmm. gave such a important sure. feedback, you know, for a lot of, um, you know, for for a lot of uh, questions, you know, we had, and also we want to include uh, Sarah Dabamna, who is originally social worker, because she also had a lot of mm. work with the black caregivers. But we also wanted that kind mm. of uh, social aspect because we are all the others of us, like a mm-hmm. BCBAs, except her. So we kind of really felt that it's mm-hmm. important to get a quality of the paper to just maybe have one more, like a you know, point of view. So that's kind of, we were really mm-hmm. lucky they were able to, uh, you know, join and collaborate. So, so I think that's why, you know, as you said, some headings are clear because, you know, we had such amazing, you know, team. And I said they already did a lot of research and they are the one who actually talked to the families. So that kind of really was mm-hmm. good to just, you know, make the paper more meaningful. Mm-hmm. Well, that's awesome. And I, I, it's great that you include these folks. And there's some few other kind of authors that I saw in here that were also, you know, that, that, that folks will recognize, I think, from some of these uh, kind of kind of recent recent articles that have come out. I won't get in too much to sort of the the problem. I think I think we're we're well aware of it. This article does a really good job of explaining it. And I don't want you just to read the article to me, um, but um, but uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll just kind of read the headlines, and then I want to just maybe if, if we can kind of touch on. I think the important piece, which is the action item. So what can, you know, behavior analysis do about it? Uh, and that's what I really, been, that's what I've been really liking about a lot of these studies is they have action items, things that, things that we can do today, you know, to start, to start making some of these changes. But uh, some of, some of the big issues, and I'm just kind of looking at the headlines here from the article are, are um, uh, you know, combating institutional racism. And, and that, that quotation I just read was sort of specific to that. And, and then how, and, and, and uh, there was one, another one kind of, and kind of related to kind of the, the health piece, uh, racism during the diagnostic process. I mean, we know um, um, uh, there's a lot of statistics there that, that you know, uh, black folk in general have a, 
have a much more difficult time of, of, of either accessing diagnostic services or, or when they get into it, um, that the professionals in some cases, you know, you know, don't, don't actually believe them, uh, that, that, that what they're saying is true, that you're, you, you know, you're, you're, you're describing these symptoms or whatever term you want to use behaviors in your child. And the pediatrician is like, no, that, 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 that you, you, how, how could you even, how could you even recognize those as a black person? How would you even know that's happening? You're, you know, essentially the message is, is you're not intelligent enough to sort of, you know, note those things, which is just, just, just horrible. Um, uh, and, and I'll just read this quote quickly. I remember telling the, the pediatrician that, uh, that my child is not saying any words, you know, common, a common, um, um, indicator of, of, uh, of autism and when they're, when they're not speaking when they should be. Um, and the pediatrician, you know, basically just avoiding the question, well, some kids take some time, you know, you know, it, 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 it'll, it'll, it'll happen eventually or, or, you know, and so not acknowledging that, um, you know that 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 parents are are are, are you know uh, are, you know parents of children with autism. Most parents of children with autism are, are get pretty well educated pretty quickly. Um, um, and I know this one piece about sort of that you know that uh, um, that that education isn't always available to 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 black folk and they actually have to seek that out themselves and so quite often they in fact know even more than you know maybe maybe the white the white parents do because they have to seek out all that information on their own um and so to be sort of you know judged and 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 and, and discriminated is, is just awful another one ex- experiencing racism while accessing services and we've heard a lot about that in in some really good podcasts i highly recommend you know the beautiful humans and the shades of aba and um, and some of these other podcasts that really kind of tell some 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 sad but really important uh, kind of stories in in those areas and 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 then it goes on to sort of some some other um 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 areas where where this is happening and i think you know a lot of the papers have come out and done a really good job of opening our eyes to to the the the, the discrimination in these areas that all said the the paper finishes and again I, I just love it with with some recommendations and and and, and, I, and, I, and I'm hoping maybe we you can maybe talk a little bit about more of those what are the things that we as BCBAs can do you know essentially to to combat racism I think first you know first off in maybe you know not only in our own in, in our own field but just in 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 you know in the world as a whole the third secret word is bias yeah <clears throat> yeah so i like um i mean i was just thinking now you know the the comments you made you know about um mm. everything so i think it's kind of really important when it comes to that what we actually try to do in the paper is really about giving mm. some as you said like a steps you know just kind of some you know action mm-hmm. step how we can uh combating uh like a racism overall and we mainly focus on provider racial bias the reason why because that was probably yeah. something we could actually all put in place right now for you know institutionalized racism sure. takes much more uh work uh, obviously we do have some for and sure. there are some really good papers that have been done on that uh section you know like a really how about mm-hmm. fighting in you know, overall when it when we talk about like a provider, first step that we mention was mm-hmm. really to like a build knowledge about black cultural values, because um, mm-hmm. in that case, as, and I think we kind of really touch and base earlier um, about this one because we need to understand, you know, culture, uh, other culture than our own, if we actually want to be good practitioners, we need really to have that type of mm-hmm. uh, ability to learn what is important from someone else and that might differ from what mm-hmm. we believe but otherwise we can never be you know successful mm-hmm. and we cannot help you know our clients and families if we don't have that uh like a really knowledge that's kind of really like a really first thing mm-hmm. and that probably could relate not only for mm-hmm. black 
caregiver, just in general, you know, if you work with a, you know, Asian family, as you said, maybe coming from Jap- you know, Japan, okay, do we have some way how we can learn? Well, okay, let's maybe first see, mm-hmm. are there some uh, paper that may be explored with the families? Are there maybe just in general, mm-hmm. some, you know, cultural uh, paper that they do talk about the values that maybe, you know, Japanese society mm-hmm. has? So I think that is something mm-hmm. we first need to do to really understand, mm-hmm. you know, other, uh, you know, the values of the other culture. And in this particular case, you know, we focus on respect and on awareness of Black families' um, attitude toward ASD. We chose these two, again, based on what the qualitative studies told us. So that was one of the, you know, mm. uh, things that parents reflected on. Mm. So I think that kind of... Yeah. No, absolutely. That makes sense. And there was one other piece in that sort of cultural values that I thought, so that the attitudes to worry ASD was interesting. And that's an interesting read. I, I highly recommend folks take a look at that because I think there's some, some perspectives that you might not be aware of, but I, I thought one of the, one of the really important ones, and, and it seems, it seems like a no brainer, but it was be, being transparent um, in, 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 a, a, as a service provider in terms of what, you know, service is going to look like from the very beginning to the very end and what our interactions are going to look like and what supports I'm going to provide and what I'm going to ask from you, you know, all basically explaining your whole service. And I think it, 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 it seems, it seems odd, you know, from one an- angle that folks wouldn't do that for everybody. Um, but it's but it's it's really important for um, particularly for you know black caregivers and I think other caregivers who have really felt felt you know uh, uh, you know kind of the, that level of kind of racism and oppression. There, 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 there. I think there can be a and and I think the article touches on this. There can be a sort of a, a lack of trust um, um, with you know because of the way they've been treated over the years and historically, and so if you don't sort of come forward with all of that information right away, you know, up front, um, um, you, you may be giving the message that you're either hiding something or, you know, you're, you're having, you know, prejudice, prejudicial thoughts that you're not including now, but might come in later. Um, you know, you might provide a service that's not as, you know, culturally appropriate. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that is really, really important, you know, having, the transparency and building trust. Because mm-hmm. as you said, the family might be exposed for so many years to different forms of discrimination. So now they yes. come, you know, let's say I'm a clinician, I come to their home. Why they would trust me? I mean, mm-hmm. why am I different mm-hmm. from all the other, you know, healthcare workers that they work with? Why? So yep. in that case, really being open, honest, it's, it's crucial. Mm-hmm. Um, having really listened to what family's saying, because I feel mm. sometimes, you know, we are so focused on making the best intervention goals, you know, putting that report for the insurance company. That's very often we forget to actually sit and talk to the families about it instead of just be like, okay, mm. this is done. You, you just go sign and do it. Well, it doesn't work like that because, you know, even if family maybe sign, and they might be like, okay, you do. Mm-hmm. But outside of the session, they will not work on those goals. And that is the problem. Then mm-hmm. what is the point of just mm-hmm. doing two hours, you know, a day? Obviously, mm-hmm. we know, you know, we want to change something which is socially significant. And if we think about that socially significant for that particular, uh, particular society or family, know what we believe it's a good thing to change. So I really mm-hmm. agree with you. Mm-hmm. Being transparent, being open and honest it's kind of really crucial, especially if we work with a family that you said it had for so long time, you know, negative experiences. So we definitely need to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Totally. And you touched on, um, I think, which is maybe the, the, the next sort of recommendation is around, and you touched on this and really it's about, it's part of being transparent is listening. Um, and, and, Again, you know, I've seen this recommendation in a couple of papers now, um, uh, and and it's 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 unfortunate that we actually have to, you know, explicitly tell behavior analysts to listen, 
um, and, 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 and give them those skills. In fact, part of that episode 26 there with Natalia, she talks a lot about sort of, you know, the, the specific skills and, and, and techniques kind of required to, to, to listen properly, um, particularly to, to, you know, to, to, to black caregivers. So, exactly. Yeah. It was very, yeah, yeah. I loved that episode was very like uh you know useful and a lot of good tips but i mean that uh, sometimes exactly sound like why you know because sometimes it's like a common knowledge why i would say something like that is expected but actually it's not because yeah. if it's exp- you know like that there will be no any issue which is you know we know it doesn't happen and i think this was one really interesting like a quote that was from like a burkett and uh colleagues and they mm. when they asked mother she said i don't really go too much by the blueprint as they say I try to adapt the blueprint mm. to what I have. And that mm. is something really important to, I think for all of us clinicians to understand, we cannot just go and expect family will do whatever we want. We need to yes. find what family can do in a given in you know, mm-hmm. circumstances in this moment. And from there on, we can build the skills. We can you know, do, but we mm-hmm. cannot just go and throw something uh, and expect, oh, perfect, they will just fall off. I mean, especially mm-hmm. if you have a home-based services, I feel it kind of even, you know, it takes time. We go in someone's home. We see them, you know, outside of the session. How to say it? You, you see how, you know, family lives. So we kind of really need to respect mm-hmm. that. Otherwise, I just don't think yeah. there will be any success in a treatment overall if we don't have that partnership with the families. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've made this comment a few times in, in interviews um, uh, as this comes up that, you know, I think one thing that is, and, and if I just had a conversation with one of my, my supervisees just prior to, prior to, to talking to you um, about, uh, you know, how, and I think you come from a different perspective because your, your training was quite different, but how behavior analysts, in general, like an ABA program in university, you know, really doesn't include any, any kind of counseling, listening kind of training. Um, and, and, and it's such an important skill to have to, you know, to build those relationships and engage with families. Um, um, and it's just, it's just, a, I think it's just a really a missing piece in, in graduate programs. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, completely. I agree. And I, you know, yeah. you know, hope that, uh, there will be more exactly you know courses yeah. uh, programs uh, and you know overall just continue education on that so we can yeah. really improve yeah. you know our uh, skills in that sense so I do agree totally totally uh, I'm, I'm gonna I want to touch on one other recommendation there, there's there's three others here that I could I, I wrote down that we, we don't have to dive into too much I think partly because um, the article just explains them all really well, but also because um, uh, I've got a couple other episodes that really touch on them, and so folks can really dive into them. One is the culturally relevant interventions. I mean, I one obvious one, and and uh, uh, and I've seen this from a few different intersectionality kind of perspectives. I had heard is the is around um, uh, one example that was in, in in your article was around. Um, the picture symbols in in the picture exchange communication system, and how for the most part they're very they're very kind of white centric. Um, um, there's you, you 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 can I think now you're starting to we're now seeing starting to see multiple skin tones and whatnot. Uh, but and then the other one was around another one was around kind of being aware of your own biases and prejudice. And we've seen I think we've had a lot of really good research coming out around implicit bias. Um, uh, the the episode I did with uh, Victoria Suarez, she talks a lot about implicit bias and how to measure that and all those sorts of pieces. So I think folks can get a lot out of that. But there was one area that I that I had never heard of before, um, and I was hoping maybe you could touch on this a little bit, um, that it's really important for us to consider the Black linguistic consciousness. What 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 is that about? Yeah, well, um, so what we came up, I, I mean, to that aspect was really um so i'm mean, obviously not the best linguist you know in you uh, to explain but the idea would sure. be that sure, there are sure. different dialect and different like a provision when you talk 
a lot of like our black folks, mm. yeah, they will, you know, because one of the mom oh, okay. over the phone, when she was saying, she said when right. she talks over the phone, she try, she tries to not sound black. Because she said every time when she talks uh, with somebody and they figure out she's black, they said, no, we cannot do it. Yes. So that was the idea yes. something. Well, okay, if we do use some kind of, uh, you know, AC device, let's say, and we do, uh, why then we have, again, white a voice who is saying, you know, the words. Why mm-hmm. we don't actually mm-hmm. then adapt to the black, uh, you know, dialect mm-hmm. based where mm-hmm. they live. Instead yes. of just being, because every yes. time it's like a white, you know, like a white Amer- right. American. So that kid, that was the idea. Well, why we don't use that and actually, you know, adopt right. based on, you know, because that what child hears the family, yes? The mom and dad speak like that, grandma speak like that, and then they're using AC device and then they're like, a, you know, white American. I got gotcha. you. So I that gotcha. would be idea yes, to adopt yes. that. That reminds me, I guess, and that this is kind of that whole area. Uh, and again, uh, around kind of code switching, um, um, uh, um, which I've heard a lot about and was, was of course, uh, probably new to many people um, um, in the last couple of years. Um, and I'm actually, I just happen to have the quote right in front of me just by coincidence. Um, so I'll just read it. It says, uh, often parents have to resort to code switching or speaking in a manner that can mask another's perception as to their race or ethnicity. Well, on a phone call, Letitia said that on the phone, she can speak, quote unquote, prim and proper, and doesn't always, quote unquote, sound African American. But the person figured it out and didn't let her son in. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, that's, that's, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, wow. so... I mean, you can see then how far it goes. I mean, in yeah. how deep yeah. is embedded when even, you know, and yeah. then not just that, yeah. you know, through all those, you know, parental like, uh, you know, uh, stories, we can actually feel at least little, little. No, I mean, obviously we can never experience everything, but we can at least feel a little what they're actually going through on a daily basis. And that's something just small. Mm-hmm. I would suggest a small sample of, you know, what they're going through. So I think it's really, mm. it's really hard for families. Um, and hopefully, you know, with, as I said, you know, with more people being interested in the overall, uh, you know, discrimination, racism and just culture, it, it will improve. It will be better. Mm-hmm. 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 Ah, really cool. Really, really, really cool article. And, and again, I think for folks, you know, that, you know, uh, that may may struggle with just reading in general. Um, this is a great article to kind of uh, maybe start with because it does cover uh, a lot of the work of some of these other articles, and then it can kind of give you a, a, a really good kind of starting point. Just as we kind of start to wrap up, I'm um, uh, I'm curious, kind of, what are you working on these days? What's what's the projects you're 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 focused yeah. on? Well, I'm currently really interested about writing that that paper about stigma in uh, ABA, but from mm. uh, like a parental perspective, like a more like a family stigma. Mm. So that's something I'm kind of, yes, again, yes. want to write, um, just kind of explain a little what stigma is and how we can, and why it's actually important for ABA, why we care. Because you think about, well, there are so many things, why we care? Well, we do because we do work with families. And if we don't understand, you know, them, and we don't understand what they're going through, how we can even expect that any of, you know, intervention we do will you know, have a long-term impact. So that's something like currently, and I've been doing, and also there's some more research about Mm. like, you know, Serbian families. So um, Mm. I've been writing on that, but, uh, but I'm really passionate. You know, that's what I said that I'm able to uh, at least meet families, Serbian and like uh, my, you know, some professionals online. So we meet like a once a month. Mm -hmm. And I just go, you know, sometimes we discuss some case studies. Sometimes we just go through different, um, you know, different ABA principles. But I do even that like a once a month. You know, I have uh, so many people saying that uh, they could see real improvement, uh, you know, with the the kids Mm. they're working or with their own kids. So, you know, I think that those are some small steps that we, you know, like we can help families. You know, I mean, sure, there are a lot of us, uh, you know, in different places. So that could be one of idea, you know, one hour a month. Yeah, um, yeah. It's not, you know, two hours, it's not a lot. But for the families and professionals yeah. who do not have access to ABA, it's a, it's a huge thing. So mm-hmm, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
No, I don't, and I love that you're doing these free free ABA webinars for for the folks over there. Is is uh, did did Serbia know about ABA before you came along? I mean, that's what I said. We kind of know there is an ABA, but there was no yeah. no one, you know, a mm. credential actually. There was no, you know, credential. There was yeah, no. I think gotcha. now maybe the, I believe there might be one BCBA now. Um, in in hmm. Serbia, actually, I think so. Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, you know, obviously, it's growing like everywhere, uh, but I think it's it's yeah. good, you know, more yeah. of us to support, you know, just better quality of life for the, you know, for the kids, and that's what matters. Right on. Yeah, so cool. I totally agree, and and good good way to end things. Well, Maria, th- thanks so much for kind of coming on the show. Uh, you know, I think you talked about um you know we talked about some really cool things um and i think this whole concept of stigma i think will be will be a a, re- a real eye opener for a lot of folks out there and and i think um uh, can really kind of change the way folks are doing their work and 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 I, i'm i'm looking forward to sort of seeing you know more of the aba specific stuff because i think that will even have a have a even more of an impact as 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 folks seem to like to have the word aba in the article before they read it <laughs> yeah. um, and, so, and so you know i think that 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 would be really awesome so just thanks again well, for being thank on. you so much ben for having me thank you everyone for listening and i mean just to wrap up from on my end I agree yeah, with you. Sure. You know, um, it's kind of like I feel, you know, stigma is very obviously complex uh, concept. So it will take, you know, much more than just me explaining in five, 10 minutes. There are already some research yeah. that they, as I said, they did in, you know, a fall from a relation frame theory uh, about the mm. stigma. So that's also a good way to start, um, you know, good point to start mm. reading. Um, and then, you know, hopefully uh, more and more people will be interested in and, um just you know having things out there so thank you uh everyone and i hope you will uh enjoy your day and week and year and life <laughs> fantastic All right, bye